We're here. A story read every single story in volumes one through six of Clive Barker's Books of Blood, including the UK edition. It's a big deal because I'm in Texas. So UK edition, yay! This one is the Book of Blood, the postscript, and I've already ripped it. This is literally my second time reading this story. I was super, super excited and went ahead and read it as, like, literally as soon as this came in. The Book of Blood, a postscript on Jerusalem Street. Wybert looked at the book and the book looked back. Everything he'd ever been told about the boy was true. How did you get in, McNeil wanted to know. There was neither anger nor trepidation in his voice, only casual curiosity. Over the wall, Wybert told him. The book nodded. Come to see if the rumors were true, something like that. Amongst connoisseurs of the bazaar, McNeil's story was told in reverential whispers. How the boy had passed himself off as a medium, inventing stories on behalf of the departed for his own profit, and how the dead had finally tired of his mockery and broken into the living world to exact their immaculate revenge. They had written upon him, tattooed their true testaments upon his skin so that he would never again take their grief in vain. They had turned his body into a living book, a book of blood, where every inch of which was minutely engraved with their histories. Wybird was not a credulous man. He had never quite believed his story, until now. But here was living proof of its veracity standing before him. There was no part of McNeil's exposed skin which was not itching with tiny words. Though it was four years and more since the ghost had come for him, the flesh still looked tender as though the wounds would never entirely heal. Have you seen enough? The boy asked. There's more. He's covered from head to foot. Sometimes he wonders if they didn't write on the inside as well. He sighed. Do you want a drink? Wybert nodded. Maybe a throat full of spirits would stop his hands from trembling. McNeil poured himself a glass of vodka, took a slug from it, and then poured a second glass for his guest. As he did so, Wybert saw the boy's name was as densely inscribed as his face and hands, the writing creeping up into his hair. Not even his scalp had escaped the author's intentions, it seemed. Why do you talk about yourself in the third person, he asked. McNeil, as the boy returned with the glass. Like you weren't here. The boy, McNeil uh, said, he isn't here. He hasn't been here in a long time. He sat down, drank. Wybert began to feel more than a little uneasy. Was the boy simply mad or playing some damn cool game? The boy swallowed another mouthful of vodka and asked matter of factly, what's it worth to you? Wybert frowned. What's what worth? His skin, the boy prompted. That's what you came for, isn't it? Wybert emptied his glass and two swallows, making no reply. McNeil shrugged. Everyone has the right to silence, he said, except for the boy, of course. No silence for him. He looked down at his hand, turning it over to replace the writing in his palm. The stories go on night and day, never stop. They tell themselves, you see, they bleed and bleed. You can never hush them, never heal them. He is mad, Wybert thought, and somehow the realization made what he was about to do easier. Better to kill a sick animal than a healthy one. There's a road, you know, the boy was saying. He wasn't even looking at his executioner. A road, the dead go down. He saw it, dark, strange road, full of people. Not a day gone by when he hasn't, hasn't wanted to go back there. Back, said Wybert, happy to keep the boy talking. His hand went to his jacket pocket, to the knife. It comforted him in the presence of this lunacy. Nothing's enough, McNeil said. Not love, not music, nothing. Clasping the knife, Wybert drew it from his pocket. The boy's eyes found the blade and warmed the sight. You never told him how much it was worth, he said. 200,000, Wybert replied. Anyone he knows? The assassin shook his head. In exile, he replied. In Rio, collector. The skins? The skins. The boy put down his glass. He murmured something Wybert didn't catch. Then very quietly, he said, be quick and do it. He juddered a little as the knife found his heart, but Wybert was efficient. The moment had come and gone before the boy even knew it was happening, much less felt it. Then it was all over for him at least. For Wybert, the real labor was only beginning. It took him two hours to complete the flame. When he was finished, the skin folded in fresh linen and walked in the suitcase he brought for that very purpose. He was weary. Tomorrow he would fly to Rio, he thought as he left the house and claimed the rest of his flight, then Florida. 
He spent the evening in the small apartment he rented for the tedious weeks of surveillance and planning which had preceded this afternoon's work. He was glad to be leaving. He had been lonely here and anxious with anticipation. Now the job was done and he could put the time behind him. He slept well, lulled to sleep with the imagined scent of orange groves. It was not fruit he smelt when he woke, however, but something savory. The room was in darkness. He reached to his right and fumbled for the lamp switch, but it failed to come on. Now he heard a heavy slopping sound from across the room. He sat up in bed, narrowing his eyes against the dark, but could see nothing. Swinging his legs over the edge of the bed, he went to stand up. His first thought was that he'd left the bathroom taps on and had flooded the apartment. He was knee deep in warm water. Confounded, he waded towards the door and reached the main light switch, flipping it on. It was not water he was standing in. Too cloying, too precious, too red. He made a cry of disgust and turned to haul open the door, but it was locked and there was no key. He felt a panicked fusillade upon the solid wood and yelled for help. His appeals went unanswered. Now he turned back into the room, the hot tide eddying about his thighs and sought out the fountainhead, the suitcase. It sat where he had left it on the bureau and bled copiously from every seam and from the locks and from around its hinges as if a hundred atrocities were being committed within its confines that could not contain the blood these acts had unleashed. He watched the blood pouring out in streaming abundance. In the scant seconds since he'd stepped from the bed, the pool had deepened by several inches and still the deluge came. He tried the bathroom door, but that too was locked and keyless. He tried the windows, but the shutters were immovable. The blood had reached his waist. Much of the furniture was floating. Knowing he was lost unless he attempted some direct action, he pressed through the flood towards the case and put his hands upon the lid in the hope that he might yet stem the flow. It was a lost cause. At his touch, the blood seemed to come with fresh eagerness, deepening, threatening to burst the seams. The stories go on, the boy had said. They bleed and bleed, and now he seemed to hear them in his head, those stories, dozens of voices, each telling some tragic tale. The flood poured him up towards the ceiling. He paddled to keep his chin above the foggy tide, but in minutes so there was barely an inch of air left at the top of the room. As even that marriage and narrow, he added his own voice to the cacophony, begging for the nightmare to stop, but the other voices drowned him out with their stories, and as he kissed the ceiling, his breath ran out. The dead have highways. They run unerring lines of ghost trains, of dream carriages across the wasteland beyond their lives, bearing an endless traffic of departed souls. They have signposts, these highways, and bridges and laybys. They have turnpikes and intersections. It was at one of these intersections that Leon Weiber caught sight of the man in the red suit. The throng pressed him forward, and it was only when he came closer that he realized his error. The man was not wearing a suit. He was not even wearing his skin. It was not the McNeil boy, however. He had gone on from this point long since. It was another played man entirely. Leon fell in beside the man as he walked and they talked together. The played man told him how he had come to this condition of his brother-in-law's conspiracy and the ingratitude of his daughter. Leon in turn told of his last moments. It was a great relief to tell the story, not because he wanted to be remembered, but because the telling relieved him of the tale. It no longer belonged to him, that life, that death. He had better business as they all did. Roads to travel, splendors to drink down. He felt the landscape widen, felt the air brightening. What the boy had said was true. The dead have highways, only the living are lost. the entirety of blood. This goes back into its little case. And if someone reads it again, it has enough tears. Oh. So um, I started reading these back finally in October of 2020. And uh, I had thought of the idea. I like alliteration, even though it's cheesy. I like it anyway. <laughs> uh, even though, oops, even though um, I had thought of the idea, like I want to say in like May. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was May. Probably around the time of, of Texas Fred Nova getting moved. It's always the first week of May. 
And uh, I put it off for a really long time, mostly because I didn't have all the books of blood. And also I thought it was cheesy and silly. And the longer that the quarantine went on and the more it looked like I wasn't going back to stage immediately, I was like, I really need to keep on doing, finding something for me to do for myself, at least just on a schedule. And so that is what Parker and Grace has become. I am going back to doing burlesque in my shows, but not, but not in the way that it was previous 2020. Uh, so everything is new and different. But it's cool because I'm really grateful that I've had workers and briefs to help with this transition period. So thank you so much for reading the entirety of the Books of Blood with me. We are taking a break next week. And then the week after, we will be back with Cabal. And from here on out, I am reusing costumes because I have literally worn everything in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. Have a good May 19th break. And I will see you next week. Bye. Or in two weeks. Shoot. I will see you in two weeks. Bye. <laughs>